Previously on the British Broadcasting Century. On November 14th, 1922, Arthur Burroughs said this. Hello, hello. This is 2LO calling. The British Broadcasting Company is launched. You know, this broadcasting is going to be jolly good fun. (laughs) But only in London. Doesn't sound very British to me. So after day one of the BBC, this time... Day two of the BBC. Now Birmingham and Manchester join the party and it's election day. Still doesn't sound fully British as such, but give it time. So in the meantime, this is the English Broadcasting Century. Actually, no, it's going to be complicated to rename the podcast just because we're only talking about English broadcasting until the Cardiff station opens in February 1923 and the Glasgow station three weeks after that. So it's all English for now. Apologies. Approaching the end of season one, this is the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London calling. Hello, hello, welcome to the podcast. It's Paul Carenza here. If you're listening in order, and why wouldn't you be, then last episode you'll have joined us drifting back nearly a 100 years to when the BBC was actually launched. We think that we're the first to have fully recreated that original broadcast. And we've had some lovely feedback about it, so thank you for that. And thank you once again to those of you who've actually been part of it. Andrew Barker, Will Farmer and Tim Wonder. It seems to be you have to have a six-letter surname ending in ER to help out on this particular show. We doff our caps to you. Do spread the word about our recreation if you'd like to. Point people our way. They too can be informed, educated and entertained about the weird and wonderful origin story of British broadcasting. Now, we are nearing the end of this series. We always said we would be trying to get to the point of the BBC launching, and it's kind of launched. So we are nearly there at the end of season one. But we have many specials coming up, and the first of those will be the very next episode, the Christmas special, in fact. Then season two will cover the first year of the BBC's being, because you know that we are going to tell this the slow and steady way, savouring every milestone. Yum, yum. Oh, and our special guest this week is Cindy Kent, broadcaster, vicar, singer, presenter, with memories of actually being there at the Beeb as the light programme vanished in 1967 and Radio 1 began. So this time, day two of the BBC, I should say we're not going to be spending one episode on each individual day of the BBC. That would take a very, very long time, but it's well worth zooming in on day two because that is when the BBC goes national. And yes, November the 15th, 1922, is election day. And to report on that election, first of all, yeah, let's have a quick look at 2LO London. That had Arthur Burroughs once again back at the helm, broadcasting to a 100-mile radius, they reckon. Now, the first result was broadcast from London at 10pm, as follows by Burroughs. Hello, hello. 2LO London Broadcasting Station calling. Stand by for the first election result. The first result is from the Wallasey Division, Sir R.B. Chadwick, Conservative, 17,508. Morris, Liberal, 9,984. Conservative Majority, 7,524. No monster raving loony at this point. Then details of the reduced majority and comparison with the previous election. Arthur Burroughs would fill out the broadcast with, well, what was missing last episode on day one? Gramophone records. Now, you will know, of course, having listened to this podcast before, they've been playing gramophone records all year in the pre-BBC era, from Turm T. Rittle onwards. And now, on day two, after a rather sombre, newsy start, Burroughs brings music to the BBC a day late. So if you wonder about the order of those Rethian values we talked about a few episodes ago, chronologically, the BBC informed on day one, entertained on day two, and educated later. Those election results then were sent by Reuters at 15 minute intervals, including the result that actually the former postmaster general, who was technically in charge of all of this wireless broadcasting, just lost his seat in Parliament. How very careless. And so a new boss is needed. And thankfully, the advert's already gone out. John Reith, soon to be general manager of the BBC, has applied for that job, but not heard back yet. And indeed, he's focused on electioneering. He's busy working as a secretary on election day to Sir William Bull, trying to keep his seat of Hammersmith uh, in Parliament. And he succeeds, in fact. 
On this day, election day, Reith refuses to fly her, thinking it's beneath him somewhat, thinking he has greater things to come. The very next day, the Times reported this. To sit comfortably at home and learn by wireless the news of the polls was the experience of thousands of people in different parts of the country last night. Following their initial effort on Tuesday, the British Broadcasting Company were in a position last night to send out election news. There are between 20,000 and 30,000 people holding licences under the broadcasting scheme, and wireless or listening-in parties were perhaps the most interesting feature of election night. Whole families were able to get the news without delay, while in some cases parties of 50 or more heard the results. Parties of 50 or more. Here in 2020, we can only dream of such illegal gatherings. Election night was really most exciting. When the first result came in at about 10 o'clock, the little crowd hanging, if one may put it so, on the lips of my loudspeaker, thought that the rest would shortly be arriving thick and fast. Closing down for five minutes, said the voice of Arthur Burroughs. This is from Amateur Wireless on the 2nd of December 1922, talking about Tuolo's election night. His microphone did not seem to be quite so good as usual, for it was inclined to blur S's and F's. Possibly it too felt the strain a little. The new chimes, which strike the fourth quarter and then the hour, are quite a feature. Phones and loudspeakers reproduce them with amazing clearness. But we are here to hear about what happened across the country, where it was a similar story as Birmingham and Manchester. They prepare to join the airwaves too, because yes, this is their day of launch. And of course, that means that for the first time, those former rivals, different wireless manufacturers, different radio stations, they actually come together under this new banner of the BBC. Here's boss of 2ZY Manchester, Kenneth Wright, on just how close they were to launching the same time as London. We're suddenly told that the BBC company, that is, had been formed and we should start the public service on the uh, 14th of November 1922, which unfortunately we couldn't do because we only got the news late in the afternoon. The only way of getting the news bulletins in those days was to have them telephoned up from London, taken down in shorthand, typed and then read by myself or somebody, so that we had to delay our opening by one day, and that's why we are the 15th as against 14th for 2LO. But first was London the day before, and beating Manchester by just one hour, second to launch was Birmingham at 5pm on November the 15th. Now, we're going to go bigger on Birmingham this episode, partly because they got there first, partly also because we covered 2ZY Manchester a few episodes ago when they started test transmissions earlier in the year. But Birmingham, they kind of hit the ground running. And on a future special episode, we're actually going to go bigger still on one of the first voices of Birmingham. Indeed, perhaps the second voice of the BBC, you could argue, Percy Edgar. He became the Birmingham station's boss from 1923 until 1948, ending his career as BBC Midland Regional Director, perhaps the most influential regional director for the first two or three decades of the BBC's life. We've actually been in touch with the grandson of Percy Edgar, David Edgar. He's the renowned playwright. And David Edgar has uncovered the memoirs of his grandfather, Percy. What a find it is. And what a studio heavily draped in blanket cloth from floor to ceiling, the floor being covered by a thick carpet. Little was known about acoustics in those days, and this was considered the best way to deal with sound waves. There was no ventilation, and you may imagine what the atmosphere was like. Yet it was in that room that we forged a key, a magic key, which was to open a thousand doors of pleasure and fun and learning, the open sesame to all the joys of radio that have come since. So on a future special, that entire section of the memoir about broadcasting, David will read it to you. Meanwhile, here's part of an article that Percy Edgar wrote in the BBC yearbook 1948, just as he retired, on how he started in Birmingham, beginning with him as director of a concert agency in New Street. One day in October 1922, I had a visit from Mr A.E. Thompson, chief engineer of the Western Electric Company, who told me he had come to Birmingham in connection with a broadcasting station which it was proposed to set up in the city. And he asked me if I would supply artists to take part in the programmes. Although there was no question of payment to the artist, I realised the publicity value for the agency and agreed. Within a very short while, Thompson offered me the job of manager of the new broadcasting station, and that's how it all began for me, much against the advice of my friends, who assured me this new form of entertainment would be dead in a very short time, just a passing craze. Hello, hello, good evening all. 
This is the Western Electric Company's station located at the General Electric Company's works, Witten, Birmingham. We are broadcasting on behalf of the British Broadcasting Committee. Stand by. We even know the first words broadcast, either by Percy Edgar or Mr A.E. Thompson, thanks to the newspapers of the day. And where there are newspapers, there's the newspaper detective who found them for us, Andrew Barker. So here we have those early stations, even as it becomes effectively the BBC, mentioning the name of the um, of the company that has uh, set up the station. The Birmingham Daily Gazette, 16th of November 1922. Broadcasting commenced officially from the Birmingham station at Witten last evening. Some 2,000 or more enthusiastic wireless amateurs in the city and the district tuned their receiving sets ready. And the many listeners in were treated to a capital musical program, an explanatory address and several interesting news items. The proceedings were a huge success. Listening in is likely to become a very popular form of entertainment in the near future. The newspaper says that that was, was a test transmission and that standard programmes would follow the day, from the day after. It was a bit breakneck, um, wasn't it? Because they had, they had to rem- take the transmitter from London, from 2WP London up to Birmingham, and it was all through the fog and is on, t- dragged on this steam tractor. And I think they got lost as well. So I think it was driving through the night, assembling it through the night, building it, and then boom, you're on air. The opening of the broadcasting station at Witten represents an interesting engineering feat. Until three days ago, the equipment was in service in London. Orders were received to transfer the apparatus to Birmingham last Friday, and within 24 hours, the whole of it was dismantled, packed, and on the road to Witten in a motor lorry. The heavy fog, however, delayed its arrival until Sunday. Under the supervision of Mr E. A. Thompson of the Western Electric Company, the equipment was installed at Witten and a studio and reception room for artists fitted up within three days. And what a bizarre and hectic first night it was. There was the news, read fast and then slow, just like Burroughs in London the day before, although Burroughs claimed it was to test the right listening speed, while Birmingham said it was so that listeners could make notes. Then there was the overheated generator. One poor engineer spent the entire night greasing it in the basement. Thanks to the dense fog, artists got lost on the way to the studio, with ladies even having to go via the gents' cloakroom. A likely excuse. Polling day 1922 must be marked in red letters by you fellows in the Midlands. You've certainly started your broadcasting with a big splash. This from Amateur Wireless magazine, November 25th, 1922. Summing up what happened in Birmingham. I was tuning in for 2 LO, 100 miles away from Birmingham, and thinking nothing whatever about it when suddenly there came a voice clear and loud. You can bet your pet condenser that I didn't worry about 2 LO anymore. This was something new, and it turned out to be very good indeed. Unfortunately, I didn't keep a list of the various items. Which well, she did. But it would have been a formidable one, seeing that I tuned in at 6pm and had it all the evening, with intervals for rest and refreshment. It was still going strong when I switched off and went to bed at 11.15, The cheery announcer, with his clear articulation and breezy stories, pleased me particularly. The items by the members of the Birmingham Orchestra were very good indeed, particularly the song Il Baccio and the violin solos. The announcer had a very good plan in giving the names of the performers. To give the names both before and after the item helps the man who is tuned in in the middle of an item, as he knows then what he has been listening to. So yeah, there we get the idea of mentioning what you just heard before and after the song. DJs, take note. The only criticism I have is that the room in which the Birmingham performers sang and played has a hollow, echoing sound. Unlike London, Birmingham did bring us live music. The first live music of the BBC, you could argue. The pieces included Il Trovatore, Madame Butterfly, Beatrice Best sang The Blind Ploughman, the mezzo Madge Smith sang Annie Laurie and Softly Awakes My Heart. Tenor Arthur Gilbert sang Take a Pair of Sparkling Eyes. Soprano Florence Winkless gave us Il Baccio. Now, you might recognise many of these pieces. They were sung earlier on the radio. So a ten point if you recognise those from earlier broadcasts from our earlier episodes. There were also short stories by elocutionists, Vincent Curran's The Uncle and The Lady and the Tiger, as well as children's stories. There was a flautist, Walter Hurd. Altogether, much more rounded entertainment than Tuolo in London, who the day before just brought us news, and on this day was bringing us election results and gramophone records. So why was Birmingham so much more with it? Well, Percy Edgar was a variety agent, 
and he fell in love with radio straight away, provided acts with enthusiasm while waiting for those election results to come in. By booking acts from musical, though, one issue did crop up by having singer slash dancers. Some of them did as much dancing as they did singing, which is a problem when you want to keep them in front of the microphone in a studio. On one occasion, the chief engineer, A.U. Thompson, ran up and down the studio after one performer, Thompson holding the microphone, trying to keep up and not trip up the performer with his trailing lead. Soon after, they added a stage, well, some old packing cases, actually just to keep the performers still. Now, of course, these were all made by different wireless manufacturers. So, in fact, the sound quality was a lot better at Birmingham as well. Marconi's may have been first down in London, but at 5IT in Birmingham, they had kit made in America, including the Western Electric Type 373 microphone with two carbon granule buttons. You can only dream of such things nowadays. So a couple of days after the Birmingham station has opened, the Gloucester Citizen has a piece about early broadcasting at that station. As to the efficiency of the station in question, it may be said that the speech of the operators was so clear that the difference between the voices of four of them during the last weekend was easily detected. One even breaking down and his fellow operator having to explain that he was suffering from nerves. Who we now tend to think of these very early broadcasters as being dressed in dinner jackets and being extremely stiff-lipped. But in those very early days, we are actually seeing that one announcer is, uh, is effectively apologising for the, for the other one breaking down and talking about nerves. So that was, that was rather unexpected. You put yourself in their shoes and you, know, you always feel that sense of nerves going into a, into a radio studio or something like that, thinking how many people could be listening. And th- th- these people back then, they're just getting used to that idea, aren't they? And this one guy got, got the better of him. Well, very much so from Birmingham, because they didn't really do any, any test transmissions. So the, the announcers would not have had any, any experience. So it's not surprising that people are losing their, their nerve mm. so early on in the life of the station. The reception of Birmingham 5IT was a little temperamental. Local listeners in Erdington often said they couldn't hear it. And yet letters came from as far as West Africa, saying it was loud and clear. We'll have more from day two of the Beeb in a moment. But first, we revel in bringing you broadcasters or anyone with a great link to broadcasting. And this episode, we have someone who fits the bill in a variety of ways. There can't be many people who are pop stars turned broadcasters turned priests, apart from Richard Coles, maybe, and this week's guest. She was there in 1967 when the BBC light programme turned into a pumpkin overnight and became Radio 1. She's worked at Radio 4, Radio 2 and Radio 1 in that order. She was there at the start of commercial broadcasting on LBC and Capital, Sheffield's Radio Hallam, and she became the first presenter on Premier Christian Radio. It's Reverend Cindy Kent, MBE. And for one who can't seem to settle in one place, yes, she started out as a settler. In terms of the career, I guess you're going to go back to 62. The group that I was in, the settlers, as you mentioned, was um, we entered a talent competition in the Isle of Man. We formed specifically to do that, that, which we were very fortunate because we won it. And part of the prize of winning, apart from I think there was some money, though I can't for the life of me remember how much that was, was an audition with BC Television and a record company. So it was, you know, unlike groups today who have to kind of struggle to get all of those things together, we were very fortunate it was all in one go. And I remember that our deal was to go on the BBC radio. And it was, a, I can't remember the name of the programme, but it was done from Birmingham because the group was based in Birmingham. And we had to get to the studios in Birmingham by, I mean, let's say something like half a seven in the evening so I set off on the bus from where I lived and the guys who were all in teacher training college in near the centre of Birmingham set off as well but it was the night of the biggest fog I've ever seen in my entire life I mean you you know the, the thing about you can't see a hand in front of you you literally couldn't so the bus I was on got as far as it possibly could and then it just turned us all out I'm like, oh, well, that's great so being the trooper I set off walking you know along with lots of other people so it was it was quite good the guys did the same thing carrying a double bass and the guitars and the banjos and everything. I had to carry myself and my voice and we got to the studio and they were so thrilled that we hadn't let them down to record these half a dozen songs which was a kind of audition but they booked us anyway if you know what I mean so that was my introduction to, to radio as a performer and I thought well yeah baptism by fire or by fog I'm not quite sure what it is. actually on this very episode of the podcast in fact what are the chances we're talking about that when the Birmingham studio of the BBC launched in 1922 it was delayed by a day because of fog no. Because, yeah, because there was a transmitter they're trying to take from London to Birmingham 
It was a day late. They couldn't find it because it was all covered in fog. And they eventually found it. And you got the first uh, broadcasters, the first announcers trying to navigate their way through this uh, sort of um, industrial works to find where this blooming studio is. No one could find it. And here oh, you are as well. So, that, what an amazing coincidence. So I mean, all good things start in fog. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Exactly 40 years later, another fog descended on Birmingham. In 1922, stopping the steam lorry carrying the transmitter. And in 1962, stopping Cindy Kent finding the studio. What are the chances? If you are ever booked to broadcast from Birmingham, check the weather forecast before you travel. Now, what of the start of Radio 1? Well, Cindy was there. But first, we'll pick up the story earlier in the 60s. Our introduction to telly uh, was Time Tees Television because Derek Beatty, who was the boss of Time Tees Television, was one of the judges, so our audition was with them. And we were scheduled to sing live at the opening and closing of the little local programme. You know, they always do an opt-out, don't they? You know, 20 mm. minutes the network and then this was opt-out. And so we opened it singing Cotton Fields or whatever in this minuscule studio uh, with these funny little cameras on, on stilts, as it were. And then we ended it singing Blowing in the Wind. And we got out and we got in the car and we, we drove down to the nearest garage to get some petrol. And the guy said, oh, I've just seen you on telly. And we thought, oh, this is great. This is stardom. You know, this is fame. Isn't it a shame about Kennedy? And we went, what? And while we were singing Blown in the Wind, literally, Kennedy was shot. So, I mean, yeah, um, wow. everybody knows where they were that day. But we mm. do. I mean, because that was, again, our baptism of doing television. And so, you know, goodness me, <laughs> fog for radio and a big death for telly. You know, oh, people amazing. didn't want to see us in the future. You know, keep away. <laughs> But from that small beginning in Birmingham, we then went on to do loads and loads of radio. I mean, we were on so often, somebody once said they picked us up on their electric razor, because I think partly because we were cheap, but also we, we were no fuss. We just went in, did the six songs or whatever it was we were meant to do, and finished well before the end of the session so we could all get down to the pub. I mean, we were obviously um, a producer's dream. You know, we did it mostly in one take, except when they decided, yes, let's do some double tracking, which meant you had to do it again. And, uh, but, you know, it, we make, made friends with loads and loads of producers and presenters at the BBC, uh, some of whom I'm still in touch with today. And that's, it's just been a huge part of my career, the BBC. The biggest, the next biggest thing for the settlers anyway, was the last night of a light programme. And I, I think it was a programme with somebody called Sean, and I can't remember his other name, which is terrible. I ought to remember it. Sean. Sean Kelly, I found is, is the name. Sean Kelly, Sean. yes. Oh, I'm so sorry, Sean no, Kelly. I should have remembered that that's called Sean Kelly, yes. And we'd gone in and recorded, I don't know, eight or nine songs or whatever. And the idea was they played them all throughout the show. But they asked us to go in live into the studio and sit around the table with and talk, talk it through with him because we didn't know what was coming up next. So he'd say, OK, you're going to sing for us now, which was all on tape. And we'd go, um, and so he'd turn the script around and point to whatever it was we were singing oh yes I know let's sing whatever it was and then we all went across the road to the speakeasy which was a bar club quite near the BBC in, in near Oxford Circus near Broadcasting House and uh, we had a few drinks there with a load of people but now with the clock ticking slowly up to 7 a.m. We stayed up as I recall it's going to be time to welcome Radio 1's first daily show on 247 metres medium wave whilst breakfast special continues on Radio 2 to hear the launch of Five, Radio four, 1 the three. next morning Radio 2 Radio 1 go the voice of Radio 1 and good morning everyone welcome to the exciting new sound of Radio 1 ah oh, yes Tony Blackburn we will get to him but for now we're in November the 15th 1922 even before Blackburn was born 5pm Birmingham launched and an hour later 2ZY Manchester joined them under the BBC banner. Now Manchester had been on air for months, experimenting, perfecting, finding an audience. Their very first night had news at six and then at seven o'clock a story and music for the children. Miss A. Benny read Oscar Wilde's The Happy Prince and then hurried home, bless her, to listen to the rest of the night on a crystal set. At 7.30, it was Mr X's funny stories. Mr X was a character who could change presenter now and then, depending on who was available, and had a catchphrase. Now, children, take those things off and go to bed. Good night. Good night. Now, I should say those things are headphones, OK? It was a simpler time. At 8 o'clock, it was instrumental music and songs, and at 9 o'clock, the late news, followed by popular music until those election results came in from 10 until 1 a.m. And after one, it was closed down because we don't want the broadcasters getting one over the printed press, do we? Well, as far as we were concerned, it, it was exciting to say, the, to say the least of it. One who was there on the first night was 2ZY's engineer, Hugh Bell. You see, we had equipment there. Nobody knew an awful lot about it. We'd been trying experiment, experimental broadcasts 
some days before, and we had fairly good reports, some from local people, some from quite a distance. And if we got something good, then everybody said, oh, hold it, don't, don't alter anything. And uh, very likely uh, the next night was a washout. Anyway, that night, uh, it had worked the day before, we had our fingers crossed, and when the deadline came, well, we breathed a, a, a prayer, I think, and, and put the switch in, and it worked. Everybody thought we were wizards. <laughs> I think we thought we were wizards too. That's Hugh Bell there, the 2ZY engineer. November the 16th, day three of the BBC, brought us the first entertainment programme on 2LO. 7 till 8pm, the baritone Leonard Hawke singing Drake Goes West. And the first entertainer of the BBC, Billy Beer, and uh, there are many more acts besides. And in fact, I've been in touch with Billy Beer's great-grand-nephew, I think he is, who is also called Billy Beer. And so we'll be bringing you much more about him and his other colleagues there who started entertainment at the BBC. Day five of the BBC was the first children's hour. Uncle Tom, a.k.a. A.E. Thompson, and then later on Uncle Pat soon after that. Birmingham's first radio auntie was Auntie Gladys, Gladys Colborne in March 1923, who was secretary to Percy Edgar. And Birmingham didn't only inaugurate the first radio uncles and aunties, but it also started the Radio Circle, where children could get a badge and a certificate and a shout-out on air on their birthday, all for a small fee. London, though, typically would host perhaps the more famous children's hour, with Uncle Arthur, with Arthur Burroughs, then Uncle Caractacus, Cecil Lewis, Arthur Burroughs' deputy, Uncle Rex, that's Rex Palmer, Auntie Sophie, Cecile Dixon, and many, many more. It lasted for the next 45 years, only axed to make way for the new Radio 1, which, as we heard, is where Cindy Kent steps in, because as Radio 1 started, she was there. And I do believe, I believe the set was with the 12th record to be played, a song called Major to Minor, which Tony Hatch, our producer, had written for us. This one is probably going to be as as well, I think. It comes from the settlers, 20 and a quarter minutes to eight. The announcer had a very good plan in giving the names of the performers, both before... This one's called Major to Minor. Major to Minor. And after the item... The settlers there on Pi 7N17375. And I think that was the 12th disc to be played. I mean, it was just this momentous occasion. It was like, wow, this is incredible. Because up until then, you know, we, we, we knew about pirate radio, of course. They played all our stuff, which was lovely. And the BBC played stuff that you went in and did. But this was like, oh, Radio 1, wow. This, this, you know, it was, it was, well, it was history, wasn't it, really? Was there, was there a sense then of a um, of, of big build-up to it, to this big new launch, of course, because Radios 1, 2, 3 and 4 all at the same time suddenly hit us, really, and, uh, and it Absolutely, was probably the biggest yeah. change the BBC Radio ever had. Well, I think so, yes. And, and I remember feeling that it was history, you know, even though it, it, it was, well, it was, yes, it was history. You've got that sense of something coming to an end and something big starting. Mm. And the, certainly the last thing we did before we left the studio, perhaps I shouldn't tell you this story, but the dear man is dead now, so it doesn't really matter, um, was Roger Moffat, a wonderful guy, who I subsequently went to work with when I went to Radio Hallam. He was the, one of the presenters along with me at Radio Hallam in Sheffield. He was reading the weather forecast and um, somebody set fire to the bottom of the script. I mean, it sounds very childish, doesn't it? But the script was a huge, great, long thing that had just come off the, the fax machine or the whatever, no, it wasn't a fax machine, but whatever, the, the whole thing that came off. <laughs> and he's reading it down and somebody, some idiot, decided to set fire, because we all smoked in the studio in those days, goodness me, set fire to the bottom and he had to read it as quickly as he could so that he could get it through. I mean, I had visions of Roger Moffat. And the shame we didn't have cameras that took phones and things, uh, phones that took cameras then, because that would have been a great picture to have kept. But he coped incredibly well. And did well, it if, if, they had, if they had phones with cameras on, of course, he'd be reading it off a computer anyway and it'd be far trickier to oh. set fire to it. And, you know, yeah, exactly. No, for, oh, where's the fun time. in that, really? Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that um, was great. And then listening to Tony Blackburn, you know, and announcing our record and you think, oh, wow, well, this is... This is incredible. So, I mean, the Beam has been a big part of my life because not only did I do stuff with them when I was in the group, but when I left the group, I was asked by the then producer of the Sunday programme, David Winter, whose church I went to, to see if I'd like to go on the Sunday programme and, and review new gospel records and things. I mean, some of them, Paul, were awful. And one had to be very careful how one said, well, this isn't quite, you know, whatever. Uh, but it, that was a fun way to get into radio because I learned how to write scripts and, I, you know, had them thrown back at me if it wasn't good enough and all of that and doing all that was great. 
And then from then I went on to do my own series on Radio 2. I created what is now Good Morning Sunday slot with a program called Gospel Road. Uh, I did the first series on my own. I think Cliff Richard joined me on the second series. And then the third series, we toured the country looking for talent. We got people to send us in tapes and demos and look and, and nutshell and people like that. I mean, all sorts of people were, came to the forefront on that. So, yeah, the BBC has been a huge part of my life in so many ways, both as a performer and, of course, as a listener. So whether you are a broadcaster, an engineer, a listener... I hope you've enjoyed the story over the past 19 episodes. I think we've successfully launched the BBC now. But look, it's nearly Christmas and we can't not give you a Christmas special, can we? And also 20 is a much rounder number for a season than 19. Also, in case you didn't know, I am a complete Christmas nut. I literally wrote the book on Christmas. It's called Hark, the Biography of Christmas. It's a fun, festive sleigh ride through Christmas past, like the ghost of the same name. And there's plenty of time to still get your copy if you would like to in time for the season. It's available on audiobook or in paperback. If you'd like to buy a signed copy direct from me, that's a paperback that is. I don't know how to sign an audiobook. Uh, Do just get in touch. I believe they make marvellous Christmas presents. So anyway, next episode, we will take you back to Christmas 1922, as well as ponder other notable broadcasting Christmases. But to really focus in on Christmas 1922, there's about a month-long gap, isn't there? We've reached late November 1922. It'd be great if we could hit the ground running next time. So can we bring you up to speed from late November to late December in record time? In gramophone record time. Old-fashioned radio voice, fill us in. With pleasure. Now keep up. November the 25th, it's the first 2LO orchestral concert. Only an orchestra of eight due to studio space. They face the conductor on a rostrum, a grand piano next to them. The light from one of the two windows in the 2LO studio illuminates the pianist's sheet music. The conductor faces the clock on the wall to start and end on time. They open with Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance No. 1, then bits of Grieg's Pier Gint, Fink's March of the Crusaders, and Puccini's Madame Butterfly, plus a foxtrot, a one-step, and two entertainers telling funny stories. Mr. Topless Green, a baritone, sings three songs with Stanton Jeffries at the piano. Oh dear, we'll have to speed up a little bit. November the 26th, listeners in places such as Hollyhead and Croydon hear a concert and religious address live from New York on a wavelength of 300 metres on a 1,000 watt set. Well done, America. November the 28th, The Cat's Whisker is a performance by cheerful chubby comic Norman Long. More on him next season. November the 29th, Arthur Burroughs writes to Stanton Jeffries, Now that we are commencing to pay artists nominal fees, I'm satisfied that the time has come when we should dictate to them, in a diplomatic way, what style of song it is in the interests of all that they should sing. We need songs of a really popular character, not necessarily trashy, but items either exceedingly well known or which might go with a swing. Future Top of the Pops producers may empathise. December the 1st sees stories broadcast by Mr A. Stainer, including The Gardener or The Worm That Turned. December the 5th sees the first radio talk from Deputy Director of Programmes Cecil Lewis, who gives a talk for 2ZY Manchester on flying in China. And on this day, they bring the children's corner to Manchester too. They claim to be the first to bring us children's uncles, but Birmingham seemed to claim that as well. Hmm. December the 7th, John Reith gets a letter from Sir William Noble asking him to interview for general manager. Reith writes in his diary that it seems an excellent job for him, but adds a note ten years later saying, I actually had little idea what it was. December the 11th is the first vocal quartet programme, as I'm sure you're aware, and an article appears in the Times with predictions for broadcasting in 1950. Mr William Dubillier, a pioneer in wireless telephony, says, I think that in a short time, broadcasting will get beyond the control of any government. It must become a great civilising and educative influence. And the Carnegies of the next generation, instead of providing libraries and institutes, will endow big broadcasting stations, which will put the finest music and other valuable things at the disposal of millions. Famous singers and great orchestras will give concerts which may be heard over vast areas. Election candidates will reach a whole electorate in a day instead of taking a month. Farmers will get daily reports on market prices and all the important news. By 1950, isolation should be a thing of the past. Let's read that again. By 1950, isolation should be a thing of the past, the Times said in 1922. Well, yeah, try 2020 on for size. But yes, the radio has found new life this year in our spells of self-isolation. So maybe isolation is in the main being made extinct by the hero that is broadcasting. Anyway, you're about up to speed until about the week before Christmas 1922, which is where we will pick things up on our Christmas special. Plus, we'll be joined next time by Xmas expert James Cooper from whychristmas.com. 
after that, then in the new year, we're going to have like a loose ends episode, I think, hopefully answering any big questions from the story so far and clarifying and correcting, if I'm honest, a thing or two from the previous 19 episodes. So if you have any questions or clarifications or comments yourself for us, do drop me a line, paul at paulcarenza.com, and we will sort that post bag just after Christmas. Don't forget that we're on Facebook and Twitter at BB Century. I'm on Patreon. If you would like to support the podcast, patreon.com slash Paul Carenza. And thank you to those who do. And hello to new patrons, Alan and Becky E. They have a longer surname, but for GDPR reasons, we'll call them E. Or for one-off tips, you could go to coffee.com. That's ko-fi.com slash Paul Carenza. Always delightfully welcomed as well. Or indeed your ratings, reviewings, sharings, and generally spreading word of this time-sapping project. Now, I'm off to get my bumper radio times and a big highlighter. Oh, the Not Going Out Christmas special. I helped write that one for Lee Mac. Do make sure you circle that one in your listings, Mags. And as we prepare for Christmas, make sure that you get in your ears this festive season the Christmas special of the British Broadcasting Century. Ho, ho, ho! The British Broadcasting Century podcast is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. The original music is composed by Will Farmer. Archive clips are either so old they're public domain, or the property of the BBC. We thank them and salute them. God bless Auntie Beeb. We're just here to inform, educate and entertain. Thanks for joining us and stay subscribed for the Christmas special of the British Broadcasting Century.